Good afternoon everyone. Today's kitchen session, Hunger Games, Food and the First World War, were presented today by Professor Tim Grady from the University from the Department of History and Archaeology here at the University. My name is Claire and I'm one of the higher education advisors here. Um, I'm also joined behind the scenes today by my colleague Anna. Um, I'm just going to start by reassuring you all that your video and audio won't be shared at all during the course of this session. And just in terms of how today will work, um, I'll shortly be handing over to Tim and during his presentation you'll be able to ask questions in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. You can ask questions anonymously if you wish, you just need to tick the box to say that you wish to be anonymous. You can also like questions that other people may have asked so that we can prioritise those in the Q&A at the end. Um, so that's everything from me, so over to you Tim, thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for the introductions there. And um, thanks. Thanks to everybody for, for coming along today and join, joining me this afternoon. Um, as, Anna, as Claire said, sorry that I'm Tim Grady. I'm Professor of History here at Chester and I work in the Department of History and Archaeology. I'm going to have a chat with you all today on this, to this topic here of food and the First World War. Um, do feel free, please add any questions you may have as, you, as as we go through and I'll come to them at the end and I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer uh, as, as best I can really. So the topic of food in the First World War is um, something that I talk to my students in the first year about. I have a module on the First World War in the first year and this is one of the topics that, um, that we look at and, and we think about. So I thought it, it may be worth exploring a little bit today in a little bit more depth to, to all of you who are joining. What I want to do basically, I suppose, is I want to, and I'm going to hold up these vegetables and see if you can see them, these lovely vegetables here. I've got a kohlrabi, I've got a swede. I don't know how well you can see them, but they're not maybe the most popular vegetables perhaps for us, for people to eat, uh, turnips, swedes, kohlrabi, this kind of thing, nice root vegetables. But what I want to try and explain is how and why these vegetables basically became the most important foodstuffs in Germany during the First World War. And I think by trying to look a little bit at these swedes and, and turnips and things, it, it tells us something about the centrality of food for the outcomes of the conflict. Two. OK, so that's my aim. Now, in Germany during the First World War, the winter of 1916 to 17, quite a harsh winter, and it took its name from, or at least how it was termed by Germans, it took its name from the humble Swede, the humble turnip, and it got called the turnip winter. So the turnip winter of 1916 to 1917. And the reason for that was quite simple. By this stage of the war, the main food for Germans was the humble Swede, the humble turnip. So lucky them, really, that's what people were living off. Not great, not entirely appetising, but that's how things have descended. Um, now, you could ask, I suppose, you know, how can you live off a Swede? How can you live off turnips or kohlrabis? Um, and I can assure you, you'd be absolutely right to ask that question, because if I suggested to my children that's what we're having for dinner for the next few weeks, they'll be out <laughs> utter uproar. And I think actually when they come home from school, they're going to be quite disappointed to see that I've got an ex a few examples of turnips and sweets here that we can eat during the week ahead. Um, anyway, by uh, 1916, people had little choice, really. Um, the turnip was really so ubiquitous that people had to find a way to live with them. They had to find a way to 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 eat these eat these vegetables in order to to survive really. Now they were helped in this task with some really lovely little cookbooks and here's one here. This is a German cookbook for 1917. Um, effectively the new turnip war cookbook if you like. I'm not sure what the old one was, um, but it gives you practical tips for preparing different uh, meals from a turnip. And when you flick through the book, it, it's actually got 50 different recipes inside. Here's the uh, contents here. And there's like 50 appetizing ways you can eat a turnip. Um, so you could eat, eat it with apple puree, eat it with lemon, with beans, mashed potato. Uh, if you're feeling particularly adventurous, you could steam it or fry it, eat it dry or fill it, a stuffed turnip. So 
you know, there's nothing to be worried about. You could you could live a happy lifestyle on your turnips. I'm not sure I'm particularly sold by that, but um, that's how things looked by 1917. The serious point here, of course, is it tells us how dreadful the situation must have been for people within Germany by this stage of the war. So I guess the question then is how did people or in Germany and how did Germany itself get to this stage? How did you get to the stage of, of living off Swedes? Well, three important reasons I just want to mention very briefly here because it fills in the context is um, the first of these has a lot to do with um, naval warfare. So at the start of the conflict, the British, supported by the French, um, imposed a blockade on Germany. And the British were able to do this with naval superiority using their uh, Grand Fleet, which gave them uh, a superiority over the Germans at this time. And they could use their fleet to effectively blockade Germany. And that's what they did. They imposed a naval blockade, blocking the English Channel and the North Sea, as you can see on the map here, um, using mines, using ships, to, to ensure that any, um, any ships coming in trying to head to German ports could be stopped first. You could stop them and say, you know, what's in your cargo, what you're carrying, um, what kind of materials are you taking in? and then seize it if you decided it was going to be used for the war effort. And food came in into this eventually too. And that meant, of course, less food going into Germany and less food into Germans' bellies. So that was a big problem. A second problem that German people face, which leads to food shortages, is um, lack of workers on the fields. So you've got people called up into the army, of course. So you've got a, a fewer workers in the fields. Women um, take over a lot of duties, um, but there's also a lack of horses. You can see here in this image, there's no horses here. Horses are utilised in the war effort, so you get a lot of handwork on the fields. Um, and this hits food production as well, so less is being produced at home. So that's a big problem. A second big problem is a poor distribution of food in Germany. So government tries to intervene, the authorities try to intervene to distribute food, but they kind of tend to make it worse. And you find some food stockpiled in one place and another place has got no food at all. So poor distribution is a massive problem too. So that's how Germany enters this real problem where they're living off um, lovely vegetables like these. Now, as this problem hits then, what's, I suppose, what's the response of the authorities to these shortages? What, what, what do they do about it? What, what, what are they going to do to try and resolve the problem? Well, their first response, I think, is really to stick their heads in the sands and pretend almost like there is no problem. You know, what, what's the problem? There's plenty of food out there. And you can see this in some early propaganda postcards and posters and things like that. And here's a couple here. Um, so there we go. You know, um, the, the postcard on the left there, uh, a couple of rather healthy looking rotund Germans there. They've been eating eating plenty of food and uh, all's, all's happy. What? The British are going to starve us, are they? I uh, don't think so. We're fine. You look at the image on the right, similar kind of message. This is the efforts of British starvation, is it? Well, we've got food, we've got um, some, some carcasses hanging off, animal carcasses hanging off the gate there. Plenty of food around. No starvation going on here. So trying to deny it, I think, was the first approach. The second approach that comes in a bit later is about adapting things. OK, maybe there are a few shortages, so let's try and um, think about how we use food a bit differently. Uh, let's try and make more of the food we've got or use, use alternatives. And I suppose the cookbook I showed you was trying to do this because it's saying, look, Swedes, lovely vegetable. You can do loads with a Swede if you just learn how to cook it properly. So that's an adapt adaption and adapting to circumstances. And added to that, there was kind of like, I suppose, using alternative pro products. So as that's products. OK, we might not have loads of coffee beans. Fine, but we can still enjoy a lovely cup of coffee because we're going to use dandelion roots to make our coffee. You know, not a problem. Grind those down a bit bitter. 
but it's kind of coffee. So replacement products, ersatz products become really important. And the most well-known example of that in Germany during the war is in terms of um, war bread. Um, so we might not have wheat flour, okay, not a problem. We're going to grate down Swedes, we're going to throw in a few dandelion roots as well and grate down some potato and then you've got a lovely loaf, you know, nothing to complain about. So the approaches to food shortages in Germany were initially really deny it and then try and use a lot of replacement goods where possible. Fine, okay, that's that's worth trying. Um, the reality on the ground, though, proved rather hard to ignore and had pretty damaging consequences for the German people. So the authorities try and downplay things, try to suggest these replacements. But if you're living in Germany, particularly in an urban environment, you know, you can't really pretend this away. This is a reality. So what what were the consequences then of all of this for German people during the First World War? Well, the first big consequence and the first big thing that happens, um, and you see this across Germany during the First World War, are queues. People end up queuing for absolutely everything. And this this uh, image here, this is of Dusseldorf, so a properly urban area. And you've got people here queuing outside a potato shop, a potato distributor. Um, it's quite a long queue, as you can see. Um, and by 1916, people are really queuing for everything going. They're, they're queuing for potatoes, um, they're queuing even for turnips by this stage, such as the shortages in Germany. And you can see, I suppose, from the image, look at the um, look at the people here. A lot of females queuing in this in this queue. And the burden on this really falls on women. It's women who are getting up at the crack of dawn, crack of dawn to queue for basic foodstuffs. It's women who are also looking after family, looking after the home, um, and also working, and then working in war industries too. So they've got all these things they're trying to balance um, just to keep things going and just to have any kind of nutritional benefit from something. So that's a big impact. Another big impact that then builds out of this is in terms of morale. People are hungry, they're standing in queues on the streets, um, this undoubtedly dents people's faith in the war. And you can see this increasingly in Germany through strikes. So here we've got uh, striking workers in Jena, uh, July 1917. But the number of strikes in Germany increases, well, from 1916, but really from 17 into 1918. There's a lot of strikes. Some of these are about wages, some of these are about conditions, but food is often a factor too. The biggest strike in January 1918 that starts in Berlin amongst munitions uh, workers, they one of their big demands of the government is we want more food and we want better food. We do not want to be living on this kind of thing. We want something to go with it. What this tells us, I suppose, in effect, is that people are losing faith with the authorities. The power of the state had diminished. They were not happy with this conflict. They're not happy with the way things were going. Um, but the biggest consequence of this is, I suppose, not just queues, not just strikes, is the fact that people are actually suffering with their health. Um, so here we've got here people um, on the streets in Berlin around a soup kitchen where they're trying to get some sort of watery broth. And you can see here they're almost fighting just to get this watery broth. But that's to sustain them, to keep people almost alive give them enough calories to keep going. And there's, uh, I didn't really want to show other pictures, but there's some quite um, nasty pictures of people cutting up horses on the street just to survive, people scrambling through rubbish for food scraps. And that's what life is becoming like on the ur urban streets of big cities in Germany um, in the latter stages of the war. It leaves people now malnourished. It leaves people susceptible to disease, to illness, and that is, or that was, really dangerous when the Spanish flu pandemic hit in 1918. Now, 
1918 alone, it's estimated that um, civilian deaths in Germany were up to about almost 300,000 people above the pre-war average. And a lot of that was caused by, well, poor diet and then the Spanish flu coming through as well, or the so-called Spanish flu, I should say. All of this then brings us back to, to where we started with our, our turnips and our swedes. So did the turnip lead to Germany's defeat? Well, no, no, it didn't. Germany was certainly defeated militarily. Germany was defeated on the Western Front in 1918. But I think what we can say is that when Germans entered the war in August 1914, they did so to defend their country, but also to maintain their living standards, if not to improve their living standards. They certainly didn't enter this war to starve. That was that was on nobody's minds. So when food shortages hit, when people are spending their days in soup kitchens or in queues and, and they just not got enough food to feed their family and they're struggling with the turnip cookbook to find anything nutritious to eat. Well, their faith in the war, their faith in the military leadership, their faith in the, the government shrinks. And I think there's only one small step really from there towards ultimate defeat and then to the very important revolutions that take place in Germany in November 1918 that eventually ushers in the Weimar Republic. Um, and that's where I'll leave it I think. So there's a very brief and very quick overview about some of the importance of food in the First World War and really how that affected Germany and affected the German people um, at this time. So let me just say thank you very much for, for listening and thank you for your attention. And I'll just stop sharing my slides now, I think. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, that was really interesting. Um, you know, it's an angle of the war that you know, we know a lot about that. or We feel that we know a lot about that period in history, but it's really an angle of the First World War that you don't hear much about, you know, the, the citizens in Germany. So that was really interesting. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment from the audience um, in the chat, but I have got a couple of questions, um, just questions that I've sort of um, you know, thought of while I've been watching. Um, so how long did it take for food, the food availability to go back to normal at the end of the war? No, that's a, that's a that's thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so obviously the war ends in 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 November. Things don't come back to normal um, straight away, and in fact, there's quite a long period before things do come back to normal. One, Germany's in the midst of revolution when the war ends, so there's chaos in the streets of Germany. But two, and I think more importantly, is that the Allied powers, who are now victorious, decide that they're going to leave the blockade on Germany. And they decide, you know, we've got a bit of a bargaining tool here on the German people. So if we take away that blockade, the German people, you know, they might have, they might start to have something over us. At the moment, we've got something over them. So let's wait until they sign the peace treaty properly and put their signatures to the Treaty of Versailles. And then we consider lifting the blockade. And that's what they do. So for food shortages, the war ends. But food shortages then continue all the way through into 1919. And this creates, it must be said, a lot of anger amongst the German people because they're saying, hang on, we've, we've signed the armistice, we're sort of fighting. Why have we now not still got no food? You're, you're sort of making us suffer for no reason. You're hitting us. We're not even at war anymore. So it does go on and suffering for the German people continues way into 1919. Well, I didn't know that they kept the blockade in place. That's uh, yeah, that's that's really quite interesting. And uh, did we have the same problems in Britain? Were there food shortages in Britain as well? Uh, yeah, so you kind of comparative is yeah, yeah, comparative history like that. Yeah, that's always really important to think about too. Um, there were food shortages in Britain, but never to the same, nowhere near the same extent as in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And that's because, um, well, Britain manages to bring in food supplies from overseas more easily from its empire at the time. Um, it's much harder geographically to cut Britain off from where Britain's situated in comparison to Germany, because you can quite easily cut off Germany because the access routes going through 
are, are narrow through the English Channel or through the North Sea. So Britain could do that. Germany struggled to do the same in reverse. Now, it did attempt this um, with its submarine warfare campaign, and it used submarines to try and sink British merchant vessels. Um, and But it hit all sorts of problems trying to do this. This is where the um, well-known signal Lusitania comes from in 1915. That creates international outrage, and Germany has to stop doing this. It, it uh, returns to the idea in 1917, but cannot do enough damage to stop um, goods coming into Britain. It, it, it just is not geographically and logistically not possible for uh, Germany to do that. Nonetheless, there are food shortages in Britain because Britain, of course, suffers agricultural shortages just in the same way as Germany does with people called up. Um, but it only really hits Britain uh, later year of the war, really, towards the end of the war, where rationing comes in in a big way. And you also see some queues outside shops in, in urban areas in Britain, too. So it does hit, but it's a less, much, much more reduced way than in Germany. OK, thank you for that. No um, I'm just checking there still aren't any questions in from the audience, so maybe this will be the last question but I okay. was interested in the in the war bread that you mentioned in your presentation so what, what was that actually made out of? Yeah so well <laughs> it kind of um, anybody, <laughs> I think what anybody could find to put in it almost right um, so they're all different versions of this different incarnations of war bread right. um, and I think whatever well to be honest, German, German, even today, Germans are very proud of their bread. Yeah. Um, and like um, sort of dark loaves, I'm sure you'll have seen. Um, don't like this kind of uh, British or American white bread, but sort of dark loaves. And even today, actually, it's very solid stuff. And I know when I visited or visit friends of mine in Germany, oh, lovely bit of, uh, you know, brown bread, black bread. And, it's quite solid stuff but so even then I think with what they put in in the bread at that time made it even more solid and the picture I showed on the slides is an example of historic piece of this and the Imperial War Museum's also got a sort of solid section of this because it just seems to have gone really dry right. and it, it hasn't you know it's not got mouldy or anything no. it's so solid but um but the things they were putting in it back then um were bits of swede bits of um, turnips, potatoes, things that you could grate down and add to other other bits. There's talk of sawdust going in some of it. It's completely unappetising and unappealing loaves. Yeah, it doesn't sound very tasty. <laughs> not, not in the slightest, no. And I think you'd have been, well, one of the things about this is that people's identities, I guess, are very, very entwined in the food they eat. So with the First World War, when people are forced to eat different types of food, um, they'd like, you know, a nice warm loaf of bread, you're used to, and then you get something with turnips and Swedes grated into it. This is affecting the way people imagine themselves and the way they, they lead, lead their lives and the way they eat together and all this kind of, so it has wider impact on society. And that's also quite important, I think. Yeah, no, that, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, we can't compare what we've been through in the last year to to a war situation. You, you, we had a small taste of that, didn't we, when you can't get everything that you that you want and it, it impacts morale. It does. It impacts on your lifestyle. So no, that was, that's 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 fascinating. Thank you, Tim. Um, I can't see any more questions, so maybe it is time to round it up for today's session. Um, so what I've done is you'll see that I've just popped a link in the chat um, to the rest of the kitchen session. So all of our past sessions are available through this link and our upcoming sessions are, are available to book there as well. So we have got a couple of lectures coming up from colleagues of Tim's in the history department. And there are some really interesting lectures from Tim's colleagues um, that, that, that we happened last year as well that you can catch up on. Um, so take a look at those and I hope you find something that you like. And all that remains for me to do today is just to say thank you to Tim once again again for a really interesting lecture and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.